for the first time ever, Indies in IMAX. Indiana Jones. Always knew someday you'd come walking back through my door. Experience the ultimate adventure like never before. <laughs> Fully restored from the original 35mm print. Any questions? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Eddie PG. Exclusive IMAX one week limited engagement. September 7th through 13th. Tickets on sale now. Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to GeekFest France. My name is Carlos Barone, and joining me today, I have James here. Say hi, James. Hello. Today, we're going to be examining the current re-release of Raiders of the Lost Ark in an IMAX format. This is something that was recently done, obviously, to tie in with the Blu-ray release of the Indiana Jones box set, if you will. This is a brand new release that's never been done before. Usually, you know, when it comes to like Lucas and Spielberg, they take their time into hitting the Blu-ray market. And Spielberg is finally getting around to putting out his major, major releases in Blu-ray. Recently, we also had Jaws finally put out on Blu-ray and now Raiders, one of his biggest, biggest hits, which is also a Lucas production. James was lucky enough to be able to go see one of these IMAX screenings. Now, from what I understand, they had a couple of things I remember they were offering. One was the IMAX Raiders of the Lost Ark screening, but I also saw something about they were doing, I think, all the four films in a non-IMAX marathon format, which I don't know how many people got to see, but the fact that Raiders was somehow transferred or upgraded or something to an IMAX form, it's a big deal. So, James, tell us a little bit about your experience, but also tell us about your connection to the original Raiders. I mean, were you young enough to see it in the theater? What did you think of it at the time? You know, because I distinctly remember that from, you know, from when I was about, I think, 11 years old. Yeah, I saw it in 1981. And ironically, I knew about the movie because of Starlog magazine, and it's a Star Wars production, basically, a Lucasfilm production like, you know, the Star Wars team, Steven Spielberg. But something about it didn't make me want to rush to the theater like I would for Star Wars or, uh, you know, some type of science fiction. So I kind of delayed a little bit, and I didn't see it till about September of 1981. It came out in the middle of June, originally. And let me tell you, I can't believe I waited because... What I had read was interesting, and it looked good, and Harrison Ford is great, but I don't know what I was seeing that year, probably you no know, Clash of the Titans or something like that, <laughs> but it was a great movie, and I saw it in the theater, and I had a great time, and obviously I didn't turn back, and now, seeing it again, it felt just as exciting. Now, how many times have we seen these movies? I, I can't even tell you on various different formats, but this was the first time I had seen it again in the theater. And I was telling some friends, it flew by. It didn't feel like two hours. It's kind of like, you know, some of these new movies, Batman. It didn't feel like it was two and a half hours or wherever it was. This movie, I couldn't believe it was over already. It still has fantastic pacing. It's still funny where it's supposed to be. It's still dramatic where it's supposed to be. And it looked great. Now, I have to say, I was very excited to go see it and that they were re-releasing it. And I wish they would do it with more movies. And they're starting to again. I feel like in the 90s they did some of this, and um, it kind of fell out of fashion a little bit, except for like big movies. You know, uh, maybe maybe every now and then you'd see some big, big movie. But in the past, since DVDs, most people aren't into it the same way. You'd have to go to like a specialty theater or a charity screening like they did, I think, in Empire Strikes Back in a charity screening that actually Harrison Ford and Peter Mayhew and George Lucas attended. Now, this was a limited screening from what I understand. Not only was it in a few theaters because of its IMAX nature, but it was only for a week. It was only for a week. And at the end of the week, the weekend following the week of release in IMAX, that's when they did the marathon. So this movie came out the 7th of September. The marathon was about the 15th. Now, I wouldn't want to sit through that knowing at the end how unpleasant I would feel at the end during Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls. I like the movie, but I don't think I'd want to. For some reason, it's kind of like a Star Trek marathon. I like certain ones, and then other ones I don't need to see it again. And even a Star Wars marathon, if you were to sit through it, if you saw the original trilogy first, you might not want to stay around for you know the, the prequels. It just depends on your point of view. This IMAX release made it special, because in addition to it being in the theater as a re-release, 
it was on a big screen. Now, most places it wasn't on the real IMAX. Now, if anybody listens to us, we've talked about this, how some theaters are licensed IMAX, but they're not as big as a special IMAX theater. Right, they're not the wraparound of... types. Well, IMAX isn't necessarily wraparound. Don't get yourself fooled by that. But it's a bigger screen. It's like, you know, there's certain dimensions, which supposedly makes it IMAX. And sadly, IMAX has licensed itself to theaters who can't quite make that conversion, but can still get a bigger than normal presentation. But I've gone to a couple of movies that way. I saw Prometheus. Uh, now I've seen Raiders. It's not as bad as you would think, as long as the theater is a well-kept-up theater, good sound, you know, clean presentation. So I was not worried about that. What I was worried about, though, was this was not a digital film. And it's not quite a blow-up, but in a lot of ways it is. And uh, I was worried that maybe there would be some problems looking muddy, because we've seen conversions of freshly made movies Mm -hmm. that a lot of people complained about. The remake of Clash of the Titans, some people said, looked a little, you know muddy or dark in some areas a couple other movies are like that well especially because of the 3d conversion that's probably contributed to it when you put it all together but there were scenes that looked so clear close-ups images that look so clean and so crisp i'm not sure how much effort was put into it to make it that clean i don't know how much of a restoration needed to be done on it some films age really bad this one wasn't the problem however i did see some i don't know if i'd call it blur or muddiness on certain wide shots. And we had talked about this, that maybe it was from second unit stuff or a particular film stock that might have been used in certain areas. I noticed in particular, in towards the beginning, there was a, a jungle, a wider shot. Later on, there's some of the desert when they show the digging in Tannis. Mm-hmm. And uh, towards the end, when they're in Washington, D.C., and they show a, a panoramic landscape of D.C., it looked a little muddy. It looked a little, it looked, I don't know if that's going to be a problem on the Blu-ray when mm-hmm. we see it, but it might have been just the way the presentation was. Well, I wish I would have had a chance to see it because I was interested, in especially not only the visuals, but the sound. That's one of the things I remember most about the first time I saw the movie. I had a similar experience to you where, yes, I would follow Starlog because back then, Starlog was our only source of any kind of regularly sci-fi genre material. There was no TV shows dedicated to it. Obviously, there's no internet. So Starlog was it. There were a couple of other magazines. I remember, I think one was called Fantastic or something like that, but it wasn't as good as Starlog. Starlog was the... And Entertainment Tonight, for instance, had oh. only started a few years before. And it was general entertainment. Yeah. It's not what it is today it about would be, it would tabloid be stuff. Stuff like this would be mentioned, but... right. It was more like uh, nice interviews with you know right. star stuff. I'm sure. Like I'm sure news... they present presented yeah. it, but it just so for some reason I didn't run to the theater the right. way I did for most of my other movies. What I do remember clearly is that in the advertisement, you know, in the posters for Raiders of the Lost Ark, it did say from the creators of Star Wars and like and close, close encounters, encounters or something yeah. and jaws so that's what triggered you know in my mind wait a minute star wars star wars wait that's that's me that's my stuff I, if these guys have something to do with it and then you make the connection harrison ford harrison i know that name oh wait a minute it's Han oh Solo. no no i knew exactly okay now that's getting a little more clear yeah. then i remember uh, at some point i think i went to a, a regular candy store or something and they had the raiders of the lost ark comic book And then when I started kind of flipping through it, I'm like, wait a minute, this is something that's very interesting. Even though at the time I wasn't like an adventure film, but they weren't really many adventure films other than if you consider like a Bond film or something like that. Well, that's probably, now that you mention it, that's what probably took up most of my time because For Your Eyes Only came out in the summer of 81 as well. Which is a good Bond film. And, And it's one of my favorites ever. And I saw that in the theater... At least four times, I think. I remember spending a day just rewatching it at least two or three <laughs> times in a row and then another time going. So I guess in my mind, you know, I didn't drive. I, <laughs> I wasn't old enough to go on my own. And as much as my well, how pa- old were you? Uh, 12? I was about 12. You're right. And my parents took me to movies and things that I wanted to do a lot. But I mean, I guess I just didn't push for this one. and Or maybe they also weren't thinking about it themselves. They were, you know, they were more into James Bond mm-hmm. at the time. Plus, a, a movie of that time period was completely unheard of for That's our time. That's the thing. I was very We'd much into seen space like movies that. and right. Star if, Trek. If you, the closest thing we had to that was watching an old black and white movie on TV, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess that's the thing. That, that brought back that style of, right. uh, of storytelling. You know, World the, War II, really, for us, was black and white. Even though, you know, you have some Guns of Navarone type of color stuff, but 
it just wasn't trendy. And, and, it, and, and if you think about it, it didn't become trendy. There were some imitators, but they didn't catch on. This was a movie that was groundbreaking and great, but luckily it didn't become a, a new genre. Yeah, we'll get into a couple of the copycats that <laughs> came out afterwards. Some of the people we actually know from other movies and shows. But the sound you mentioned, and the sound was, it even won an Academy Award, a special award for sound editing. Mm -hmm. And that's something I noticed in this presentation. It sounded fantastic. It was so crisp. And I went back to read that Spielberg and Ben Burt were involved in yeah. this transfer. Now, I don't know how much. I'd venture a guess that Ben Burt had more of an involvement in the sound transfer than Spielberg did in the visual presentation transfer. Mm -hmm. He may have given his okay once he saw it and stuff. But you know, there's not very many people better than Ben Burt sound-wise. And this, you could still notice, and they made it so you would echo in the surround sound. I clearly remember the first time I saw the film, two sound effects that I, I will always remember. One of them is the boulder as it's coming down, and you hear the crunching and crunching yeah. as it's coming down. The other one is, in the Ravenwood bar, the gunshots of not only Indy's gun, which is the first time we get to really hear a good sound of the gun. But the machine gun. But the machine guns, it's like a, it's almost like a jackhammer. It's like, da 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 And the gun is like a cannon going off. And, and it's, again, it's one of the first times as a youngster that I'm noticing audio you know, because audio, you almost never notice it in a movie. It's almost like, and it's it's usually a secondary thing. But here it was like, wow, this is really very loud and realistic, even though we didn't know what realistic was like. And are you telling me that in the IMAX format, obviously it's not an audio format, but in this particular presentation, those kind of aspects were popping at you too. You hear everything. And it's not just like they added some echo. Like I remember in Star Wars when they tried to add some echo into the chasm before they did the swinging. That seemed a little fake sometimes. They overdid it. This was clean. Everything was clean. It sounded the, the engines of the plane, the uh, flying wing, and things like that. It was really well done. I had made a point to tell my friends as specifically about the sound. Afterwards. How about the, uh, let me ask you this, the, uh, I remember that there was a goof, I guess, in the original, and that is the glass, the mirror between, between looked, Indy and the snake. And, and, and I'm not sure in previous DVD or laser disc editions they were able to digitally remove that. Did you notice that at all? I looked specifically for that, and I figured on the big screen, because that stands out. There's really not that many goofs. Right. There's a couple things if you watch the making ofs and stuff of how they did things. I looked for that, and you can't see that. Hmm. I, I think they fixed that either when they did a, a DVD transfer. The last time. Yeah, I don't know how much cleanup they did in the DVD, but I'm pretty sure that is gone since then, and it wasn't here. Now, the movie was never originally shot in IMAX, so how do they go from a 35 millimeter or a 70 millimeter to IMAX? Well, it's essentially a blow-up, or it's transferred into a digital format so mm -hmm. they can be more cleanly shown in the modern theaters. And is there and, a danger of, of losing quality? Well, there would be if you did it straight. But because they made the effort to go through, like I said, with Spielberg and Ben Burt make, overseeing uh -huh. the visual and audio portions of it, this isn't some kind of school film. These are people, you know, trying to, they're, you know, they're tops in their field. So you don't want people complaining that was a sloppy transfer or something like that. So they did it right. And I was looking on the edges. Sometimes when they do these types of things, the edges have what they call a coma. And you lose, it gets a little dark around some of the edges really? if they do a blow up or something. And this didn't happen. And, and I specifically look for this when I'm going to see an IMAX presentation. Kind of like Attack of the Clones when they did the first Attack of the Clones in IMAX special release. Right. Or a digital release of Phantom Menace back in 1999. You had that loss of image on the edges on the big screens. But when they did the digital presentation, it was crisp, the whole screen. How was the scene in the Well of the Souls when they actually open the arc and we get to see a full lit arc for the first time? How does that compare to like the previous time? The Well of Souls is probably my second favorite scene next to the map room. I love the map room. I love that whole part. I hate the snakes. Just I just don't like snakes like uh, Indiana Jones. I don't like. So I watched that all very closely. And I remember them talking about those scenes. You mentioned the cobra with the glass. And I remember how they kept complaining that the studio was kind of cold. And I kept watching because I do remember in interviews and in making of interviews how the snakes would almost go into a hibernation or they just they'd stop moving. So they looked dead. So that was really good looking. And when the, the lighting, when they first lift the arc up out of the uh, sarcophagus, out of the, out of the casing, the gold light, if you watch it, it's still so well made. The shots, the angles, certain points of view shots, 
and you're not going to be disappointed on Blu-ray. It's just too bad more people didn't get to see it in the IMAX. Well, how about at the end when we have the big special effects, you know, hoorah at the end where every, you know, all the bad guys are getting their comeuppance and the ILM really goes into overdrive. How did that look on the big screen? That, unfortunately, in this presentation was one of the sections that bugged me. And it looked a little muddy. Some of the shots, they almost looked like they were inserts, especially Belloc in his ceremonial robes. Some of those look a little too grainy and almost a blur. I, you know, It's almost like when you take off your 3D glasses and try to see the screen when you're watching a 3D <laughs> presentation. And if anything suffered, it was that. And again, I don't know if it was the stock they used or if it's because a, a lot of it was shot wide. And even the wrath of God, basically, when the, the tower fire goes into the heavens and then the top of the ark comes back down. If anything looks fake all these years later, that was the only thing that bothered me. That section, the melting of it, it just didn't feel for some reason as good as I had hoped. But it didn't take me out of the film. I, I know that scene. Everybody knows it. But watching it on a technical point of view, I did notice that. It just it looked a little subpar <laughs> for what the rest of the film looked in that presentation now all the outdoor stuff the, the the car chases in the desert the trucks all that stuff they still... look great very crisp the close-ups are crisp the action is just as you know just as exciting i remember seeing uh, some making ofs how they had to cut a bit of a ditch underneath the truck so when indy was going through it now some of those other things like and also a scene where the truck overturns in the Cairo market, they actually launched a Ooh. telephone pole at the bottom. Right. Now, I knew to look for it. I don't think you would see it if you were just a casual <laughs> film goer. Well, we looked for remember it now. That. That's the but, problem. Yeah, that's the trouble. I was looking for certain things to see if I would still see it or if they tried to take it out. And I'm glad, actually, they didn't because that makes it more cool that you know that, that yeah, they did it. It's not so obvious it jumps you in the face, but it's still cool that it's there. And I, was, and I, you know, I could look for it having <laughs> known that inside stories. Well, sounds like you had a good experience. Now, let's go back to what we talked a little earlier about. Obviously, this movie led to a couple of sequels. And some of them took longer than others to appear, but it also led to a few, very few imitators, if you will. The one I can think of one was like King Solomon's Mines or something like that. That was with Richard, Richard, Chamberlain. Richard Chamberlain. And then there was Tales of the Gold Monkey oh, a TV with show. our good friend Stephen Collins, who McDowell. was in Star Trek, the motion picture, as Decker. <laughs> and Roddy McDowell from, uh, Planet, from of uh, Planet of the Apes and various other things. Uh, they were not that good. They were trying. Like, King Solomon Mines had been around since the 40s, but they were trying to do a quick remake on a license that they had. Right. Even years later, I would say, even though Tomb Raider was based on a game, <sighs> it was kind of... A female and, Indiana Jones. And in an ironic manner, Tom Selleck did a movie called High Road to China, which was not exactly Indiana Jones, but it had a little bit of the adventure. And he, and he was our, supposed to be our original Indiana Jones. And right. A lot like Pierce Brosnan not getting James Bond right away. Until he bailed for uh, Magnum. He couldn't get out of Magnum once they... It, Magnum was still somewhat popular, and once they heard that they that were they interested... they wanted him for Indy, they said, boom, let's we start got it. Yeah, if he's still so popular, we're going to hold him for one more year, and they did. And I think it worked out for the best... For us as fans. Well, given the fact that this apparently was only available for a week, what kind of audience numbers did you see? It's disappointing. I ordered my tickets in advance expecting there to be, you know, a crazy line or at least a crowd. Mm -hmm. And my friend saw a night screening in New York City, and there were only three people in the theater. I saw it in the daytime, which might have led to the reason why my theater was empty, but there was only about four or five people in my theater. And I talked to the theater manager, and he just said there wasn't a lot of demand. I, I was worried about a line, and he just trust me, there won't be any line. And I saw it a little bit differently when I went to see the 3D version of uh, The Phantom Menace, which was not even close to being as good of a movie as Raiders of the Lost Ark. And there was a line. Now, maybe more kids are likely to see a Star Wars movie, which I did see a number of kids and younger people in addition to, you know, an older crowd. In this, it was adults only, and it didn't seem to be pulling people in. Now, I didn't see it advertised any place except for some other websites and, you know, a DVD. Yeah. But when they mentioned the Blu-ray was coming out, it finally, and they mentioned this in addition. But I've seen that to be a problem with some of these uh, re-releases. So I don't know who's really in charge of the marketing of this. It's clearly not the same people who do the first run marketing, because... Just this past year, you've got Raiders, you've got Lawrence of Arabia, 
Lawrence of Arabia was being shown supposedly totally restored and remastered and ready for Blu-ray one night, one showing on a Thursday. E.T., like we mentioned, Spielberg got around to re-releasing stuff on Blu-ray. E.T. Now, I at least saw some trailers in a theater for E.T., but nothing, no fanfare. And I'm not sure really why they do that. I would imagine they'd want to generate hype, and they used to generate. Like when Star Wars would come back for well, a release, that's pre -video it was big days. news. Exactly. I just, I just think it's a whole different... I don't think they're looking for the mainstream audiences. They're probably looking for a few people Nostalgia to, type of exactly, uh, to, audience. Exactly, to bolster yeah. some, uh, some sales and then maybe boost you know, some Blu-ray sales. I, I would love it if they did this to a lot of what we consider classic films, but if they can do it in terms of money, in other words, if, 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 if converting to IMAX is too expensive and they don't get their money's worth in terms of ticket sales... I would be okay if they just re-released the film normal. This didn't need to be re-released in IMAX. That was a plus. Right. And I'm not part of that gimmick. If the movie needs to be in IMAX like Batman, and I think they shot it in IMAX for those particular reasons. They wanted to get him into IMAX screens, and they didn't want to just do a blow-up or something like that. Then it's worth it. Yeah. But this could have been just re-released yeah. in regular theaters. I think you would have gotten a bigger crowd. It would have been less expensive. Maybe the the cost of IMAX. People weren't going to pay for a thirty year old movie. I, and how much? Cost, how much it cost was it? Me how much was sixteen fifty? Yeah, that's almost like a three D ticket. And so for two people, that's thirty something dollars yeah. with tax. And if you have a Coke or a popcorn, you might as well just save your money and right. buy the Blu Ray three weeks later. And I, I have a feeling that's what a lot of people did. I would love it if they take, for example, some of our favorite eighties. You know, 81, 82 films. You take your Conan the Barbarian, your Alien, your The Thing, you know, those kind of older films, and just re-release them, whether it's a, a week or a month, but don't go crazy on them. Just, you know, give us a nice clean print. They don't have to be converted to 3D. They don't have to be converted to IMAX. And then maybe they can make enough money for them to, you know, do it on a regular basis. I mean, wouldn't it be great if every week a different film would come out in some theater? Well, there's enough theaters that are considered past their prime in terms of a regular, like a Batman type showing or something like that. The Ziegfeld, even for example, if you hardly see first run movies there, once in a blue moon or a big summer movie or something. And that's where I, in the 90s, had seen a number of big movies. I saw Lawrence Arabia there when they restored it the first time. I think if you put a different big movie like that in some a theater of that nature every week or every two weeks or something, even if you did it over a weekend, like yeah. a four-day weekend or something, I think it would be a lot more fun for the general movie people, a movie audience. Right. And maybe parents would bring their kids, but I guess there's just... Can you imagine just... that? How cool it would be? One, one week they're playing the original Planet of the Apes. Then they're playing Willy well, Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. There are <laughs> theaters. There's a theater in Jersey City, New Jersey that's an old Lowe's theater and it just seems like there's not enough of that and there's not enough hype for it either right. that's privately run by donations and stuff like that mm -hmm. it gets minimal support from movie companies i guess if it's something they're pushing you know maybe they want to release like a back to the future they'll uh, re-release a back to the future on blu-ray they'll put a back to the future well, night or something a week on back to the but future. it would just be a lot more fun you know the, the market's just not there yeah. you know it's, i mean i know i it's it's a film snob type of thing you know i know i would go to see certain films not all of them but yeah i would like to see some of the, my favorite films on a big screen especially the ones i never had a chance to like there are certain films like i said before even conan i i discovered that film on video or on hbo I never saw it in a big screen. But, Alien, same thing. But you figure you have these franchises that they're still either trying to milk or revitalize or just continue. Like James Bond, it has never really stopped. <laughs> Why couldn't Alien be out somewhere this year to bolster Prometheus right. awareness? Right. Or I know sometimes when, like, say, The Dark Knight rises, they'll have a marathon of the Nolan Batmans for one night or something. But... Don't do it just for that. To right. ju just don't do it to sell more tickets for that new movie. They've done it with Harry Potter. Now Star Wars is coming out next year for Episode 2 and Episode 3. That's just because they transferred it to 3D. Why not just put them out? I mean, it, it must be there must be right. some kind of of lot of work. It must be a lot of work yeah, for this company. And the returns are probably minimal. The returns are minimum, and it's again, it's it's more of an artsy type of crowd in an artsy type of market. You would figure New York City might have something like that. I know in Texas, the Alamo Draft House, they do a lot of these film festivals where they show these older films we but exactly we know talk that's, about. We know the reason why that is because of the heavy push because of Harry Knowles's crew right. who are fan, right. real film theater watching aficionados. And they can get the audience to yeah, come and, and sit down and to And that's these the things. type of theater, the Draft House theater that 
loves films just as much as the viewers do. I mean, I'm sure they're making money on it too, but that's the kind of place you go to and you get an experience. Yeah. You don't just watch a movie. You right. know, there's food, there's drinks, there's friends, there's groups of people. It's almost like bus tours to go see these. Right. these that's it's a, a social mecca. event. It's a mecca of movie right. watching. Right. And they used to do it, like I said all the time. You could you could get Gone with the Wind uh, retrospective at some art house. It doesn't have to be an art house anymore. There's so many things you know this oogie lover or something need whatever that movie was that the that nobody went to see it was one of the worst <laughs> openings ever it was like a, it's like the biggest goof like for something like that to take up a screen when you could have one of these really good right, movies right. and i tell people if you can see lawrence of arabia in the theater you should if you can see raiders if you can see the original star wars a new hope in a theater don't just go because it has blu-ray right. go because this is a great movie not because this is some gimmick and like we said that is our experience here in terms of not having stuff that accessible because they just don't exist right now. Even though we're very close to Manhattan, but it's a different situation. But there are few places in the country that you might be near where, yeah, they do have these places where they all of a sudden these rare older movies show up. Go take a look at them. It's, it's yeah. worth it. It's worth it. Yeah, if you're a film fan, if you're just a fan of watching things, right. I guess the home video is fine. Right. But overall, James, good time at Raiders? Good time. Glad they did it. Glad I went and wouldn't want to miss it. Great. Well, I wish I could have gone, and maybe I will to the next time they do something like this, if they decide to do it again. In the meantime, I'd like to thank James for joining us today. Thank you, James. Thank you. And we will see you here next time when we have more of these bizarre subjects that we talk about on GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. Stop.